Dear colleague, welcome to this introduction to programming of deep brain stimulation. This is an introduction to the course on basic programming and to the course on programming DBS for movement disorders at the Stereotactic Academy. We are constantly updating and improving the courses, so please look at the course curriculum at stereotactic.org for the exact course content. We are further providing practical guides on how to use different programmers as well as various software for analysis of stimulation fields, etc. etc. And please consult the lecture list for further information. But let us now continue with this introduction where we'll cover the very basics of deep brain stimulation. The first case of deep brain stimulation in a human was performed non-stereotactically in 1948, and stimulation became an important tool for intraoperative evaluation before performing stereotactic lesions. More than 30 years ago, modern deep brain stimulation with completely implantable systems was introduced and has since been applied to various brain targets for many different conditions. Even though we have thus been stimulating the human brain for quite some time, we still do not understand the exact details of what we are actually doing. There are several conflicting and incompatible theories regarding the mechanism of DBS, and this will be further discussed in detail in the lecture by Simon Little. The complexity of these theories can be quite overwhelming, and the question is mainly of scientific interest. Even though some working mainly in the clinic have a limited interest in this question, I believe that it might be beneficial from a clinical point of view to have a model of thought when programming. I will here present a very simplified model of DBS. Those of you who would like to gain a deeper understanding can consult this book on programming by Erwin Montgomery. Stimulation has roughly the same effects as lesions in the common targets for DBS and stimulation can be thought of as mimicking a lesion by blocking the normal, or in this case, the pathological activity in the neurons in the vicinity of the electrode. And the term neuron is in the following used to encompass the whole cell, including dendrites and axons. In order to transmit an impulse, a neuron needs to build up an electric charge across its cell membrane. According to the old lesion theory, DBS is acting by the polarization of the neurons lying within a few millimeter of the electrode. DBS delivers electric impulses with high frequency, typically more than 100 pulses per second. This means that the neurons are depolarized so fast that they never reach the electric charge necessary to create a neuronal impulse. Today, we know that the most important mechanism of DBS is probably activation of the axons. The neural impulses sent in this fashion through the neuron will however not be meaningful. The nonsense signals will jam the activity and hence be similar to the effect of a lesion with inhibition. DBS can thus be seen as a disruption of pathological neural activity due to blocking or jamming of the neuronal signal and the symptoms caused by this signal. As mentioned, the therapeutic effect of DBS is caused by the electrically charged particles delivered at the neurons in the actual target structure. Electrical particles spreading outside this area will not contribute to the effect, but might cause side effects. For this reason, we want to shape the field of stimulation to encompass the actual target, but preferably not much more. Further, the current from the electrode needs to be delivered in such a manner that will have the desired effect on the biological system. 
We can alter several different stimulation parameters, but remember that in the end the effect of stimulation is caused by the electrically charged particles delivered in the actual target structure. When we talk about the field of stimulation, we are normally approximating this to be synonymous with the volume of tissue activation, or VTA, also known as the volume of neural activation. This is the area around the electrode where the electric current is directly modifying the activity of the neurons. This volume is dependent on the contacts used, impedance, voltage, pulse width and frequency as well as on other properties of the surrounding tissue itself. As a simplification, the field of stimulation at 3 mA may extend roughly 3 mm away from the electrode contact. Often it is helpful to imagine the VTA as a sphere of varying size around the contact used for stimulation, but in reality the shape is more complex, especially with directional electrodes, and dependent on stimulation parameters as well as on properties of the surrounding tissues. The effects of stimulation will of course vary depending on which structure in the brain we are stimulating, and it is important to remember that even if the actual field of stimulation is only encompassing an area of a few millimeters away from the electrode, uh, there are no isolated centers in the brain for tremor, depression or various other symptoms. The brain is a complex structure that can be seen as organized in networks at different levels. And there is often a long way with intermediary steps between the brain target we are stimulating and the effects seen in the patient. And it is not always easy to understand how this effect is achieved. For example, stimulation in one structure might inhibit its activity, which may result in increased or decreased activity in another connected structure, etc. etc. However, by acting on different nodes in the network involved in such symptoms, we can modulate the symptoms. Thus, it is often possible to treat the same symptom with DBS in different brain targets, for example, STN, VIM or Colosone Serta for tremor. And further, DBS in the same target can often be used for different symptoms, such as GPI DBS for Parkinson's disease or for dystonia. And of course, the areas in the brain that we want to stimulate in order to reduce various pathological symptoms are not physically isolated entities. They are bordered and entangled in other structures where stimulation will cause unwanted side effects. We thus need to find stimulation settings with a VTA that will mainly encompass the intended target area, the sweet spot, while minimizing the spread outside of this. The therapeutic threshold is the minimum current with meaningful therapeutic benefit and the side effect threshold is the current at which sustained side effects appears. The therapeutic window is the window between the VTA stimulation settings where a good effect is achieved on the symptoms and the stimulation settings where permanent side effects are first encountered. When we activate a contact we increase the current until we reach a good clinical effect and then if we continue to increase the current, we will at some point reach side effects and the area between those two, that is the therapeutic window. So, how can we control and tame the electricity for our purposes? The most important aspect of stimulation is, as mentioned, the location of the field of stimulation. And this is most strongly influenced by where we are letting the current exit the electrode and enter the brain, thus the contacts of the electrode. All electrodes have at least four contacts. These are uh, 1.5 mm long and separated by a distance of 0.5 mm in the most frequently used models and by 1.5 mm in other models. One lead has eight contacts in a row, 
And more modern electrodes have also eight contacts, but here they are distributed at four levels, where the two middle levels have three directional contacts each. You can choose to activate one or any number of the available contacts. Adding more active contacts will spread the field of stimulation. Typically, stimulation is started with only one contact. Depending on the target and individual factors, a second contact will sometimes be added, and rarely more than two. We are choosing where the current should enter the brain by choosing the contact, but since this is an electric circuit, we need also to decide where the current should exit, and we can here choose between monopolar or bipolar stimulation. Stimulation is typically started with monopolar stimulation. With monopolar stimulation, you are using one or several contacts as cathode, while the casing of the IPG is serving as an anode. With monopolar stimulation, the field of stimulation is rounder and wider than when using bipolar stimulation. With bipolar stimulation, you are using one or several contacts as cathode and one or several contacts as a node, hence you are stimulating between contacts. With bipolar stimulation, the field of stimulation is more elongated, narrow and intense. The effect of stimulation is stronger at the cathode, and when changing from monopolar to bipolar stimulation, the cathode is often retained, while an adjacent contact is added as a node. Bipolar stimulation will in most cases increase the energy consumption, and it's used most often in order to narrow the field of stimulation, in order to avoid stimulation-induced side effects. When stimulating, we cannot decide the impedance, but this is of importance for understanding the stimulation. When the current is puring into the brain from the contact, it will encounter a resistance, and for all practical clinical purposes, impedance can be considered as synonymous with resistance and is likewise measured in Ohm. Impedance is a measure of the resistance a current encounters and this is dependent on the surface area of the contact or contacts used and on the properties of the surrounding tissue. It is uh, calculated from the formula resistance equals the voltage divided with the current. The amplitude is the strength of the electric charge delivered through the electrode. This is measured in volt or ampere. As a simplification, the field of stimulation at 3 mA volt may extend roughly 3 mm away from the electrode. The increase in the radius of the field of stimulation will become smaller for each step the current or voltage is increased, since the current is being diluted in a larger and larger volume, reducing the current density in this volume. Some patients will experience disturbing side effects for a short time when starting the stimulation. They will typically complain of strong paresthesias or electric shock. This is mainly a problem in patients with essential tremor, turning the stimulation on and off each day. In such patients, programming the stimulation to gradually increase the amplitude during the start that is ramping can reduce the problem. The field of stimulation is created by the electrically charged particles puring into the brain through the contacts of the electrode. These can be delivered either with a constant pressure or with a constant flow. Previously, constant pressure or constant voltage has been the standard. And voltage is a measure of the electrical pressure, the pressure driving the flow of the current. If programming with constant voltage, then the voltage is held constant, but the current will vary with the impedance of the surrounding tissue. This might be a small inconvenience with constant voltage during the first months after surgery. Due to the postoperative edema, the impedance of the tissue will vary, hence resulting in a change of the field of stimulation. 
This can be overcome by using constant current, which is the new standard. Current is a measure of the flow of electrical charge, the amount of electricity del delivered to the tissue. If programming with constant current, the voltage will adapt to any changes in the impedance, ensuring a constant current and a stable field of stimulation. The first DBS systems commercially used had only constant voltage. In the next generation, one could choose either of these, but in the last generation, constant current is the only option for all major DBS systems. Thus, when changing an older IPG to a more modern mo model, some patients will still have constant voltage and it will be necessary to convert this to constant current. The change can be calculated by the formula current in milliamps equals impedance divided with volt times 0.001. For example, in a patient with 2 volt and an impedance of 2000, one should use 1 milliamp. It is easy to remember that when the impedance is about 1000, then the amplitude of the current will be equal to the voltage. However, further minor adaptions of the current might be needed in the individual patient. Even when using constant current, the current or flow of electrical charge is not constant. It is delivered in short pulses. And frequency, measured in hertz, is the number of electrical pulses per second. High frequency stimulation is used in all common targets. It is typically started at 130 hertz and sometimes increased up to 180. But there are no reasons to increase the frequency above this. Increasing the frequency <clears throat> will often increase the risk for inducing side effects and lowering the frequency below 130 Hz to avoid side effects might sometimes be worth trying in a few patients. Each pulse has a certain duration, and this is called the pulse width. The duration is measured in microseconds, one millionth of a second. Typically, stimulation is started at 60 microseconds and sometimes increased to 90, or in rare cases 120 or more. In a way, the effect of increasing the pulse width is similar to increasing the current or voltage. Increasing the duration of each pulse will increase the energy delivered to the tissue around the electrode. The effect is, however, not identical. Increasing the pulse width will affect fibers of different size differently. Fibers with a large diameter are stimulated at a lower pulse width than more narrow fibers. Typically, increasing the pulse width will in the commonly used targets increase the risk for inducing side effects. Hence, lowering the pulse width to 30 microseconds might sometimes be an effective measure to avoid such side effects. Several clinical studies have demonstrated that by using a lower pulse width, the clinical effect can often be maintained while increasing the side effect threshold, thus enlarging the therapeutic window. Further, lowering the pulse width will decrease the energy consumption, and some colleagues are now first evaluating the effect of stimulation at a pulse width of 30 to 40 microseconds before considering using a higher pulse width. Before we continue, it is necessary to discuss single source versus multiple sources IPGs. With a single source, all contact of the electrode is sharing the same current source. They are tapping into the same reservoir. With multiple sources, each contact has its own current control. In reality, the IPG has only one current source, but the device is programmed to allow each contact to act as if it had an independent current source. This difference between the systems is only of interest when you activate more than one contact. So, with multiple source DBS, each contact has its own current control. 
If you activate two or more contacts with for example 1 mA, then 1 mA will be delivered for each individual contact. And if you add yet another contact, this will have no effect on the already activated contacts. This feature allows for different contacts to be simultaneously programmed with different currents and pulse widths. With single source DBS, when you activate two or more contacts, the same current is delivered through the electrode, but now for two contacts. Thus, the amount of current delivered for each contact will be reduced with half, and hence the VTA around each contact will be smaller than if one single contact had been used with the same current. Thus, this will not result in a doubling of the size of the VTA, which is a common misconception. And most often, two directly adjacent contacts are activated in this fashion. So, just to make this difference between these two technologies clear, with multiple sources, when you add a new contact, this will uh, not affect the current outflow from the first contact. With single source, when you add a new contact, then the current outflow will be divided between the two contacts. Another feature available in all systems, but mainly used with older single source IPGs without directional electrodes, is interleaving. Here, two different programs are used on different contacts of the same lead, and two alternating fields of stimulation are created. This feature can be used to stimulate two different areas with the same lead, but more commonly it is used to shape and focus the field of stimulation in order to avoid stimulation-induced side effects. The area where the two fields of stimulation are overlapping will be stimulated twice as often, doubling the energy delivered to this area. So far, we have discussed a number of ways in which the field of stimulation can be shaped along the axis of the electrode. This can be done by selecting different contacts, bipolar or monopolar stimulation, by modifying current and voltage, or pulse width, or by using interleaving. However, if the electrode is placed on the border of the actual target area, it might be difficult to design a field of stimulation which will encompass the area of interest and produce beneficial effects without at the same time encompassing neighboring areas which might induce unwanted side effects. Therefore, the new generation of directional leads permitting a non-actual shaping of the field of stimulation are of interest. In these, the highest and the lowest contacts are conventional cylindrical non-directional contacts. At the two middle levels, there are three contacts at each level. These three contacts can be activated together in ring mode and will then act as a conventional contact. But they can also be activated individually and will then move the field of stimulation in a perpendicular plane relative to the axis of the electrode. The potential advantages of directional electrodes are that by directing the field of stimulation towards the area of the best effect and away from areas of side effects, a better effect can be achieved. Uh, and this is of course true regarding suboptimally placed electrodes. However, it is probably also the case in many electrodes that are today not considered to be suboptimally placed, but where the patient achieved the effect at the price of minor side effects. Further, by focusing the field of stimulation, a better effect might be achieved with a lower energy consumption. So, in ring mode, we will have a more or less spherical field of stimulation. If we can't achieve a good symptom reduction without eliciting side effects, then we have the possibility of using directional stimulation, moving the field away from the side effects towards the area with the best symptom reduction.
Changing from ring mode to a directional contact will, due to the laws of physics, also have some other consequences. The surface area of one directional contact is smaller than that of a ring contact, and the impedance thus higher. With constant current, the voltage is adapted so that the same number of electrical particles will be delivered as with a ring contact, but to a smaller tissue volume, resulting in a higher current density in this volume. This will result in a VTA that is about 35% larger than in ring mode. A good analogy might be putting your thumb into the opening of a garden hose. This will not only change the shape of the jet and focus it into one direction, it will also force the jet to concentrate, hitting whatever it is encountering with more force. And this has three important consequences. If you just change from ring mode using the same current, then you will have a much larger VTA with the risk of overstimulating the patient and eliciting side effects. Thus, when changing from ring mode to directional stimulation, you will normally have to reduce the current. When evaluating a directional contact, this should be done in smaller steps than when evaluating in ring mode. And since the current can often be reduced, this will lower the energy consumption and can be expected to increase battery longevity. Let us now look at activation of directional contacts at different levels. With consideration to the just described differences in VTA, the directional contact can be treated as uh, the traditional ring contacts, with the obvious exception that they are directional. As with traditional contacts, we will most often use the directional contacts with only one single contact. And as with traditional contacts, we can activate two directional contacts at different levels. We can use bipolar stimulation, but this is of limited usefulness. And the same is true of interleaving. With multiple sources, different currents and pulse widths can be set for the individual contacts. And the directional contacts can of course be combined with the non-directional in the same manner. The situation is the same regarding activation of contacts at the same level. Ring mode with monopolar activation of all three segments is virtually the same as activation of one traditional ring contact. All directionality is lost and the size of the VTA is about the same as for a ring contact. With two segment activation, that is monopolar activation of two segments, uh, this will make you lose almost all directionality and is seldom worth exploring. Bipolar stimulation and interleaving can be tried, but the usefulness is limited. With multiple sources, then different currents and pulse widths can be set for the individual contacts, also at the same level. The most interesting question regarding directional leads is of course how much we can displace the field of stimulation relative to the axis of the electrode. The estimates vary, but around 0.8 mm as in this example from Matthias Åström seems rather plausible. This might seem like a very modest gain, but let us look at a hypothetical example. Let us assume that the diameter of the optimal target is 2 mm. And let us then assume that with directional leads we can be 0.5 mm further away. This will actually more than double the area where an optimal effect can be achieved. Thus, directional leads will not rescue an electrode misplaced with several millimeter, but it might be very valuable in suboptimally placed electrodes close to the optimal target. In this patient, I intend to place the electrode in the caudal zona inserta, uh, between the red nucleus and the S10. However, for some reason, I ended up to medially encroaching on the red nucleus. When stimulating in ring mode, a good effect could not be achieved, and the same was true 
when exploring the interior and the posterior medial contacts. However, when stimulating uh, with the posterior lateral contact in the direction of the intended target, an excellent effect was achieved. But remember, if the electrode is misplaced with several millimeter, directional stimulation will not be able to save the situation. We have now also a number of publications clearly demonstrating that the therapeutic threshold and hence the therapeutic interval is larger when using directional stimulation compared to ring mode. Regarding the energy consumption with directional leads, the surface area of one directional contact is, as mentioned, much smaller than that of a ring contact. Therefore, the impedance will be about two times higher. With constant current, the voltage is increased when the impedance is increased, so that the same number of electrical particles will be delivered as with a ring contact, but this will increase the energy consumption. However, with directional stimulation, the electrical particles will be delivered to a smaller tissue volume, resulting in a higher current density in this volume and a more effective neural activation with a larger VTA. Further, the VTA will be focused in the direction of the sweet spot. The current can therefore most often be reduced compared to ring mode, thus reducing the energy consumption. At group level, the increased energy consumption due to increased impedance will be lower than the decreased energy consumption due to the current reduction. However, in individual patients, directional stimulation can lead to a reduced or to an increased energy consumption. In general, if the current can be reduced with a quarter, then this will lead to an overall reduced energy consumption and increased battery longevity. And in order to achieve an overall reduction of energy consumption, one need to evaluate the directional stimulation in all patients with the specific intent of reducing this, and not only in some patients, in order to avoid side effects. And calculations of energy savings and battery longevity is also incorporated in the programming software as a help. Saving energy is of course an excellent idea since we do not want to use more energy than necessary due to the cost and risk of IPG replacements. If we are using a rechargeable IPG, then it's not so important to save energy, but it might still be prudent not to expose the brain to more stimulation than needed. In general, it is easy to understand how this can be done. Simply think of the stimulation as a flow of current or water from a battery or water reservoir. The energy consumption is increased by increasing the current, increasing the voltage, using contacts or contact combinations with higher impedance, increasing the total time of the flow, either by increasing the duration of each episode that is the pulse width, or the number of episodes, the frequency. And remember that interleaving will tend to almost double the number of episodes. Do not use more energy, more energy than you need. Consider that it might not be worth to gain a minor improvement of the symptoms at the cost of a major increase in energy consumption. In some patients where the improvement of an increased energy consumption is doubtful, consider to evaluate this by reducing the stimulation strength. When it is time to start the stimulation, our goal is to reduce the patient's symptoms as much as possible without eliciting side effects and with a minimum of energy consumption. The stimulation can be started directly when the patient has recovered from surgery, but often the start is delayed typically with about four weeks to avoid influence from microlesional effects. By introducing the electrode during surgery, we will quite often see a microlesional effect with reduction of symptoms or with appearance of side effects. This is most often resulting from the edema caused by the electrode introduction and is hence reversible within days or weeks. In rare cases, 
irreversible effects are seen. The tendency for microlesional effects varies with the different targets, and microlesional effects might make programming of DBS difficult or even impossible. In such cases, it is most often best to postpone the start or stimulation until the microlesional effects have vanished. The first step when programming a patient is, or should be, to identify the location of the electrode contacts. When the electrode is placed in the same manner in all patients, then we can estimate a similar response to stimulation. If the electrode is correctly placed, it is often possible to predict the most effective contact reasonably well from its anatomical location. This information is further of value for understanding the encountered side effects. For detailed information on how to identify the contacts in relation to the anatomy, please consult our other lectures on this topic. Guides to the use of most of the software mentioned here will also be made available during 2020. Many patients are programmed blindly in the sense that the programmer has no idea where the electrode or the different contacts are located, besides the fact that the surgeon intended to place it in a given target. With blind programming, the stimulation is simply optimized according to the response of stimulation regarding both effects and side effects. However, if the electrode is not well placed, the programmer might have difficulties in interpreting the results of stimulation and waste a lot of time and unfortunately, misplaced electrodes are common. Thus, a minimum should be that the surgeon identifies the location of the electrode and informs the programmer. An even better option is, of course, if the programmer can look at the images and decide where the different contexts are located. And please consult our other lectures if you'd like to have more information on this. Even if you have only a post-operative CT, you can still identify the ACPC and then work out the level of each contact and look at the location of the contacts in relation to an atlas. You can then make a more qualified guess on the location of the electrode. If you have a pre-operative MRI and a post-operative CT but no navigation system, do the same calculations but on the MRI instead of in the atlas. This will provide you with a good understanding of the location of the contacts in relation to the individual patient's own anatomy. Based on such information, you will be able to create a simple mental image of the electrode location and the field of stimulation that will often serve you well. There is also special software available, both commercial and non-commercial systems, which will show you a model of different fields of stimulation in relation to an atlas or in relation to the patient's own anatomy. Here we have one example where you get an understanding of the estimated size of the VTA in a model of the STN. Above we have a ring contact and below a directional contact. To the left we start with 0.5 milliamp and then increase to 1, 2, 3 and finally 4 milliamp. Here we have another example where the STN has been identified together with the location of the electrode and the estimated VTA at 2 milliamps is being displayed. If you would like to have more information on how to identify the electrode and use different software, please consult our other lectures. You can't base the programming solely on visual information, but I believe that these systems are valuable as a visual feedback system for the pro programmer. Just remember that if you are using an atlas-based model, then the individual patient might deviate substantially from this due to inter-individual differences in the anatomy. And even if you use a preoperative MRI fused with a postoperative investigation, you cannot be completely sure that the fusion is correct, especially in cases with brain shift. Thus, we need to be somewhat careful when we interpret what we see. 
Further, not all patients are equal, and sometimes the stimulation response will not be in accordance with what we expect from the electrode location and the estimated VTA. For that reason, we can manage without visual programming, but we can't manage without the next step, the monopolar review with screening of the electrode contacts, where we investigate the effects and side effects achieved from stimulation with the individual contacts. How this is done varies somewhat between different targets and indications, and will therefore be described in detail in the lectures on programming the individual targets. But in general, the patient is tested seated in a chair, if not bedridden. Each contact is tested with monopolar stimulation, typically 130 Hz, 60 microseconds, and the amplitude is increased in small steps. At each step, any effects or side effects are noted and documented for future use. This can be done using low-tech solutions like here. However, the amount of information generated can be quite large and it is easier to use dedicated software which provides a better overview and support for the decision making. Regarding directional leads, some use directional leads in ring mode and explore the directionality only if they are unable to achieve a good result. But in our experience and according to the still limited literature, directional simulation will be used in most patients when this feature is explored, suggesting a benefit compared to ring mode. And not exploring the directionality is disadvantageous concerning energy consumption. Exploring all contacts will increase the time necessary for the initial programming session. But our impression is that we will in this manner achieve a more stable and better result. We seem thus to avoid additional non-scheduled visits for optimization of stimulation and might hence actually be saving time. In the third step, we will choose the best contact. At this stage, we already know uh, the approximate effect of each contact and the approximate amplitude at which this effect is reached. Also, the approximate current after which no further improvement is achieved and at which amplitude side effects are encountered. Thus, we know the therapeutic window. We will now choose the contact with the best effect in absence of side effects for further optimization. Often approximately the same effect will be achieved at more than one contact. In such cases, the contact where this effect was achieved at the lowest amplitude is often chosen, but the size of the therapeutic window and the energy consumption might also be taken into consideration. Sometimes it is necessary to optimize two contacts separately in order to determine which one is the best. When evaluating the simulation and optimizing the simulation parameters, we need to take the temporal aspect into account. And the temporal appearance of effects varies much between different conditions and symptoms. Tremor will respond immediately to thalamic and subthalamic stimulation, while it might take weeks and months before significant improvement is seen in GPI-DBS for dystonia. And this is discussed in detail in the lectures on programming of the individual targets. Regarding the temporal appearance of side effects, most often stimulation-induced side effects will appear immediately and there will not be much adaption over time. There are, however, exceptions, as will be discussed in the following slides. Sometimes stimulation-induced side effects can appear at a low stimulation strength, but with a rapid adaptation. These are seen in their most pronounced form at the first time of stimulation and then never again or only at higher stimulation strength. These side effects might include paresthesia, dysarthria, dystonic symptoms and ataxia. The most common example are the brief paresthesias in the hand, often seen each time the stimulation is started or increased in the VIM, 
These are, however, not typical, since they will tend to appear again each time the stimulation is started or increased. Such side effects might be a problem during intraoperative macrostimulation, but rarely during programming. This side effect seems to be most common in the caller zone and CERTA, but can be seen also in other targets. And this is further discussed in the lecture on programming in the caller zone and CERTA. Due to the existence of such side effects, be patient when evaluating the stimulation. Wait some minutes before discarding a certain contact due to paresthesias and consider revisiting a contact the next day to see if dysarthria or dystonic symptoms and such are still occurring at the same stimulation strength. We also have stimulation induced side effects with slow adaption. Some side effects seem to occur when the stimulation strength is increased too rapidly but will not appear with a more gentle increase. The most common example of this uh, in our experience is stimulation-induced dystonic symptoms, especially in the face and most often with GPI DBS. When we encounter this, we will decrease the stimulation strength to under the threshold of this side effect. An adaptation will often occur and at the next visit the th threshold for these side effects will be higher and hence the stimulation strength can be increased. And this will be further discussed in the individual uh, lectures on programming. We then have delayed stimulation induced side effects. With extensive programming sessions, the patient will sometimes develop some short lasting tolerance or desensitization with later appearance of stimulation induced side effects within a few days necessitating a reduction of the stimulation strength. Delayed side effects can most often be avoided by limiting the programming sessions and or by discharging the patient to the home with about 0.3 milliamps below what seems optimal during the programming session, but with a window so that the patient can after some days increase the stimulation if necessary. The tendency for delayed stimulation induced side effects varies between different targets and are discussed in the individual lectures on these. Development of tolerance for the therapeutic effect of stimulation with subsequent increase of stimulation strength is mainly concerning thalamic and subthalamic DBS for tremor. This is a very complex question and is discussed in the lecture on programming of these targets. So please now continue with the other lectures concerning programming. And with this I end this introduction and thank you for your attention.